Good evening. My name is Ken Mejia Beal, and I'm the chair of the Democratic Party of DuPage County. And tonight, I am excited to have one of my friends, Representative Avalar, here with us today. Representative Avalar is one of our many state reps here in DuPage County. And words, I'm looking for the words to describe Representative Avalar, a fighter, an activist, and pretty much just a kick-ass legislator that I got to really get to know as we were both running during the same cycle. So it is um, going to be a fun, fun chair chat this evening. Thank you for joining us, Representative Avalar. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you so much, Ken, for, for having me here today. And, you know, as you as you talk about, you know, us running and, and on the same cycle, I just keep remembering how brutal and interesting that cycle was as well. But I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good, good. Well, this will be easy and painless, but I do have some questions that I know that folks want to know. Um, so my first question, and this, uh -huh. I know the answer, but I can't wait for you to share it. Why did you decide to run for this position? That, that's, that's a simple and loaded question at the same time, I think I would say, because, um, you know, I, I always like to talk about this because I think that where I come from, my, my lived experience um, has educated a lot of the work that I do, and particularly, um, it, it really pushed me to get involved in politics. So I moved from Ecuador at a very young age into Will County. Um, you know, I was in the ESL program where only a few couple of, of, of uh, kids with me were trying to figure out the, the public education system, et cetera. And, you know, I was also undocumented, right? I, I was undocumented for, for over a decade with the majority of that being during my high school um, and college years. And I, I say that, you know, some of us do have the privilege of not getting involved in politics. I didn't have that privilege because I knew that, um, you know, my life was on the line with immigration, right? That there was not a single day that my parents and I wouldn't wake up just thinking, will this be the day that that ICE comes to our house? And especially here in the suburbs. Um, so, you know, I, I started doing my activism work with uh, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights and other local organizations in the area. And that's how I got involved into electoral organizing. Um, and that's when I decided that, you know, even though I wasn't able to vote at that time, um, I was able to educate people on, on, on you know, what, what can a voter can do, that your vote is power. And particularly with naturalized citizens and low propensity voters, truly start the pivoting of that thinking of our vote doesn't matter to saying like our vote could actually change things. I and I came at a point that was very pivotal because this was back in the 2008 elections. Mm, we okay. all know how, and I get goosebumps right now because we all know how historic that election was. Um, and it's been nonstop from there. So when um, the, in the 85th district, when it became an open seat, um, I sat down with my family, my friends and community members and, and truly discussed what a, a grassroots movement and what a, a community power uh, campaign could look like. And out of that, Community for D came about. And, uh, you know, here I am as the uh, first Latina representing the 85th district and very glad to do so. And I'm happy that you're doing so also. <laughs> I was I was super excited for, for you on election night, by the way. Um, can you tell us what it was like to be a freshman representative following a, a year dominated by the pandemic and COVID? And what was that like? Oh, woof. <laughs> woof. What was that like? Yeah. What, what, what is that like right now, right? Um, you know... <laughs> I remember vividly when when I decided to run and my team said, you know, let's go ahead and do this. We, we can win this. We have the numbers. Um, never in a million years did we think that months later we were going to have a pandemic where we were looking at the primaries um, from, you know, our homes, watching the results come in um, as we also looked at, you know, the pandemic pretty much wrecking havoc. Um, so, you know, it it challenged a lot of us to think 
creatively, right, about what, what does it take to, to get into office, but even more so, I think it really highlighted the reasons why we do what we do, right? I think that needless to say, and, and later on, we'll, we'll probably go over this a little bit deeper, but our healthcare system, right? The fact that we had a lot of people who, you know, had a job and then, you know, within a week or so lost it. And with that, they lost their health care. Um, while a pandemic was ravaging our communities when we did not have a vaccine available, you know, it really it really made a lot of priorities change. And while affordable access to healthcare was one of my priorities, it became number one. It became number one because we knew that at this moment, we could not not have that be part of our values. So, um, you know, while I look back and I look at it and reflect on it a lot, um, so many memories uh, were created. I remember walking into, I. I didn't even walk on the floor because as you may remember, when we got sworn in, the, the House of Representatives was actually at the Bank of Springfield. Um, you know, so so you don't get as as you come in, you don't get to see the 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 General Assembly and the floor. We actually got to see this huge space where you could not tell whether it was day or night. It you truly lost track of time. Um but I remember walking in there and as I walked in there, I just thought about a conversation that my mom had with one of her cousins, which was, you know, when we, and I just learned about this a couple of years ago. Um, my mom had told a, co a cousin of hers that she was really afraid because she doesn't know and she didn't know if she made the right choice by bringing her little girls to the US. She was like, what if they don't, you know, what if they don't learn how to speak English? What if they don't do this? What if like, you know, they, they, they can't create a community here? Um, this was back when we were maybe like 13. And I remember that when I won, my mom said, all the sacrifices were worth it. So that kept resonating with me as I walked in. And um, it was very humbling. So, so I'd, say, I'd say that it's been a roller coaster of emotions um, because it's not easy to be a freshman legislator during a pandemic because we're still trying, trying really hard to recover. But, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a wrench thrown at us, you know, every single month that it's hard to keep up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is powerful. And thank you for sharing uh, that. Ooh, I don't even know. I think we're done. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> we're done. That was perfect. No, um, what? piece of legislation that you've worked on are you the proudest of what 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 if you had to pick one because I know there's a lot if you had to pick one piece what is that thing that you say yeah I did that oh my goodness that one's a really hard question because there, there was legislation that I carried right as the prime um, sponsor of it um, and I would say that there's two that stand okay. out. One of them is um, a bill that I carried, and then I would say the other one's a bill that I supported, right? So as far as a bill that I that I sponsored, um, HB 653, which had to do with groundwater testing at uh, clean debris sites. Um, some of you may know, some of you may not. In Will County, um, you know, parts of Will County and in, in Romeoville and in Bolingbrook, we do have quarries, right? And um, you know, there, there was a piece of legislation that had been in the works for over a decade that multiple legislators have been working on to try to figure out how can we make sure that none of our groundwater uh, was contaminated, right, by any of these sites. And for some reason or another, you know, it ended up being um, either did never made it at, out of rules, never made it out of committee. And I remember when I was going through the issues that I cared the most about, and with one of them being the environment, I wanted to make sure that there was something that was local. And, and for those of us who live in this area, we know the quarries and we know where they are, they are at. Um, so I said, you know, who will be, th this, is, this is common sense, we could totally do this. Um, and I picked it up. And I remember some of my colleagues said, you sure you wanna take that? You know, it's a very complicated issue. It's a very, very complicated subject. And I said, sure. Why not? I mean, it, how, how hard can it be? Shouldn't have said that. 
and and I think that was one of my biggest lessons learned because, um, you know, a lot of legislation requires a lot of work, and it requires a lot of a lot of um, a lot of research. And just to make the long story short, um, you know, I was able to take it to the finish line. Uh, you know, something that was ten years in the making. I was able to talk to those who were proponents of the bill, opponents of the bill, and actually come and sit down and talk about it and look at it, how can we move this forward. Um, and for me, that was an extremely, extremely um, proud moment of mine to say that I was able to take that bill to the finish line. Um, you know, so I would say that that is the one that I'm proud of um, as far as me being the sponsor. The other bill that really made a, 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 an impact in my life was also um, a bill that was actually sponsored by leader Lisa Hernandez. And that was the bill, the Illinois Way Forward, which pretty much um, pretty much uh, closed down detention centers in Illinois. And we voted on that in, in, um, in the spring session. And I remember um, talking to leader Hernandez and, and asking her, you know, is it okay if I, if I talk about my story? Um, because as I think about detention centers, um, this is something that is very personal to me, to the work that I've done. And, and I really do see the work that I do now as a legislator, as an extension of that activism. Um, so while putting myself out there, right, with my personal story, I think that it's a powerful story to tell because it's not just my story, but the story of over, uh, you know, 100,000 people here in the, in the state of Illinois. Um, and I remember it was the very last day of session and um, it was around seven or eight o'clock at night and we started with the testimonies. And I remember that as I was saying what I was saying um, about my story, my parents and, and the fear of, of, of not knowing if ICE was going to knock on your door to say how important it was that we were passing this legislation because we will be leading in the nation uh, and being able to pass it successfully in the house. Uh, you know, I had colleagues of mine who said, we did not know, but we appreciate you speaking out about it. Um, so I think that was the other one. I know that was really long, but I think those two definitely, you know, as I look back at this past year, I think those two stand out the most. No, you take all the time you need. I'm happy you're explaining it, though, because those are two very important things. Water, number one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm huge with our, our immigration rights, immigration reform, um, mm -hmm. because it's important. And I think we, we uh, folks like myself that are born here, sometimes forget um, how important it is to have that gateway. Are to have that path, and that's something that I've I've really worked hard on. So hearing your story and it reinforces, like, yeah, we still have a lot of work to do. So mm -hmm. I I love it when you share that. Thank you, thank you. No and, and like I tell people, I'm like, there's nothing more powerful than the than the story of self, right? Yes. What moves us, what motivates us, and and that is what allows for coalitions to build, yes. right? And and I think that. We are at a pivotal moment. Um, if the last four years didn't teach us anything about coalition building, I honestly don't know what will. Um, you know, it, it's been, it was a really, you know, the, the Trump administration was quite traumatic. I think in all fronts, whether it was immigration rights, healthcare rights, right? Human rights, um, you know, it, it was tough. And, and the fact that we, we were able to come out of it, um, you know, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work. There's to do. a lot of work to do. Yeah, but I think we've shown that, you know, it's at these moments when when you truly, truly, truly get to see where people's values are at. I agree, yeah. hundred percent agree. Um, my next question for you is, what in your district, District eighty five, mm -hmm. what's the biggest issue that you're seeing? that's coming to your office? What was that issue? I would say it varies. <laughs> um, you know, when I first took office, um, you know, the majority of the issues that we were seeing uh, were around access to uh, unemployment benefits, mm -hmm. right? As we all know, there was a big, big um, challenge 
with trying to get unemployment benefits and there was a backlog and we definitely were hearing it and we're de we were definitely uh, uh, seeing the, the, you know, that, that friction between how do we make sure that we let people know that we're trying to help them out and the desperation of knowing that we had residents who were literally a week away from depleting their savings if they had any. Right. So, so I think that, that that was one of the things that that we saw, as I said, healthcare, access to healthcare, figuring out healthcare. Um, you know, we, we saw that with because of some technical glitches, we, we saw that there were some people from uh, that were dropped from the Medicaid system. So trying to get them in as far as, um, you know, kitchen cabinet issues, um, public safety is one that has been very talked about, right? And when I say that it's been very talked about is, um, you know, I mean in a way where people want to have those conversations around what does justice means? What does it entail, right? And, and at the end, uh, you know, what I've gotten from, from talking to neighbors is that we definitely want to meet people where they are at but at the same time, not ignoring our past, right? And some of the things that have been brought up. And, and again, I think that if anything, um, the Trump administration taught us and showed us is how much work we have to do when it comes to, to um, you know, not just white supremacy, but this whole idea that, you know, is us against them, right? When, when it truly shouldn't be that way. Right. And, and, you know, I think we, we were able to have some healthy conversations here, you know, when it comes to, to law enforcement and the community, um, you know, we were running and can you remember this, we were running right in the middle of, of the, the uprising of the Black Lives Matter movement. And we saw that that was not just something that was happening in Chicago, but it also in the collar counties. And I think, you know, what that showed us is that there was a hunger to not just talk, but then also figure out what are the actions and measures that we can take to make sure that everybody feels respected, that everybody feels safe, and that everybody's being treated with dignity, dignity and respect. Um, so I think I think th those have been the the ones that we've we've talked to 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 people about, and that they've actually brought to us too. Good. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So. On I, I would say an overarching all of that COVID vaccine. Well, of course, yeah. Test. I mean, this is all this is all on uh, you know, this is all parallel to we're still living in a pandemic. Well, when when do you think that if not for the pandemic, do you think your job would have been a little bit easier? <laughs> Just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do, and, and and I would say that I just don't know because as a first time legislator, I think that there's so many things that you have to do, right? From like the logisticals of you have to build up your team from scratch, and when I say literally from scratch, it means literally from scratch and implementing policies, procedures, etc. Um, to continue to get to know the district. Um, I lived here for, for over 20 years and you'll be surprised at how many things I learn every single week. Mm. Um, you know, so I think that there's, you're always in this constant um, evolution, right? Of learning uh, about the district, right? Uh, you know, especially now that we moved on to now uh, through our redistricting process, getting to know the new areas of your district. Um, and seeing how you could meet everybody um, halfway. And when I say halfway, you know, prime example, the new 85th district, you know, has, and I need to look up at the demographics and, and the data on this, but, you know, just knowing the area, the way that I know it, um, there's pockets of my area of my, of my district that has affordable housing versus pockets of the area that have, you know, million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. right? right so and and then but the majority of my district is a district that is a mix of 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 uh you know your working class families who 
want to make sure that they are able to send their kids to college. And then also for youth and when it comes to education, um, you know, we're also seeing a lot of a lot of uh, uh, young adults and, and people also my age, right, that have gone to college and say, you know what, I don't think it was worth me getting into six figure uh, debt uh, and not being able to find a job. So right. those are also the conversations that are happening as as we uh, as we continue to get to know the district, quite honestly. So I don't know. Well, <laughs> so as you can, it's easier. <laughs> well, as you, as you continue to learn the district and know the district and learn and grow, my next question for you, because you're going to win. I'm putting it out there into the universe. So as we move into 2023 mm-hmm. legislative year, yeah. um, after, you know, the election and all that mm-hmm. stuff, what is your, what is your goal? What, what do you, what's your vision? What's your goal? Because talking to you, mm-hmm. it, it sounds like you have a lot of things going on, but what I'm hearing is that you really do just want to make your district and the state better for working class families. And and that's what I hear ringing out throughout everything you say. So moving into 2023, what's your agenda? What's your vision? I think that's exactly it, Ken, because when we look about, when we, when we even talk about lifting working families uh, up, um, you know, I always think about leadership as not being as, as you being led, um, but bringing people with you, mm-hmm. right? I think since the beginning of, of my campaign and then as, as I became a, a legislator, it's always been very important for me to make our office as accessible as we, as we could possibly can to the people, right? And I think that, you know, as we look forward to 2023, quite honestly, one of the biggest things that I want to continue to do is to learn the intricacies of legislating. Um, We pass a very important budget every single year. And, and, you know, when when I used to work at a social service agency and organizing agency, I remember that one of the things that truly, truly made me think about running for office was when Rauner uh, cut all the social service agencies, yeah, it affected and it decimated a lot of our safety net. And I remember being out at the Thompson Center, you know, protesting with our with our community organizations, with our immigrant rights, with our domestic violence, uh, with our ho- um, homeless shelters, and saying we are essential. And and remember thinking, I don't ever want to get to a point as this low point in, in, in Illinois as we are right now, where we decimated our, our safety net. So I think that what I want to make sure that we do is that when we talk about our budget, which is supposed to be the moral document of the state of Illinois, that we continue to do a budget that is for the people, right? And I think that a lot of that entails getting to know, right, not just the line items, but the priorities, right? What are some of the things that we need to make sure that are always funded? Um, you know, are, are we are we paying our, our, our social service agencies, um, you know, are the grants enough? And if they're not enough, how, uh, what are we doing, right? Like I said, I'm a non-for-profit geek. I'm a, by profession, social service is my jam. <laughs> I'm, always about, I'm always thinking about what's our strategic planning. How do we get here? How do we get there? Um, so I think I definitely want to know more about that. Um, you know, healthcare, it's difficult. Whether you want to take on more transparency uh, on on how we... we um, give out grants, um, whether you want to work on on making sure that um, people actually have access to affordable quality prescription drugs, affordable quality health care, whether your goal is to make sure that people don't go from um, skipping out on their medication or having to cut down on their medication so that it lasts them longer. Um, I want to be able to work on that. Um, so as, as far as 2023, I think it's just continuing to pave the way, um, to make sure that whatever we do in the state is definitely guided, um, by, by the people of Illinois, right? And, and in my case, by the, by the people in the 85th district, um, you know, Dagmara Avelar, the person 
right? I, I, you know, I have my set of values, right? Mm -hmm. And and I'm very proud to say that in the 85th district, we shared also the same values as well. But there are going to be times when, you know, we are going to take controversial votes and they're not going to be easy. And uh, my goal is to be able to come back to my district and, and defend my vote, um, whether it's a yes, whether it's a no. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's learning. Believe it or not, it's been a year and I've been telling people it feels like a year, a day and a decade at the same time. Oh, okay. That yes. doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound <laughs> bad. It sounds long. It sounds like you might need a nap. <laughs> so my last question for you, because I know uh, social justice is your jam, but when you're not doing social justice, when you're not in Springfield, what do you do to unwind? What are you doing to relax? What are you doing to de-stress? I wish I could answer this question in a better way than I'm about to, <laughs> but I'm a workaholic by trade. So literally like what I do for self-care is um, I, I push myself to not be on my computer a lot, right? Or not be on my phone a lot and actually um, go out with my, I have two poodles who are my absolute joy um they're seniors now so so one of them is 16 and the other one is 14 and right. you know i was i was blessed enough to to know that when when the pandemic started i was able to work remotely and really spent a lot of time with them especially when my my older dog um started to have complications with, with uh, arthritis um and i say all of this because quite honestly my self care is being with them being able to to be with them when, when I say and I don't know I don't I don't know if you have pets I don't know if anybody in the audience has pets but they're my babies <laughs> I, under, I understand you create, this <laughs> you create this connection when honestly they truly know when you're having a really hard day and they know how to make you feel better so yeah, so self-care my 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 cute little poodles Jerry and Bella oh <laughs> Well, that, that's a great, I, I have three rescues, two dogs and a cat. So I totally get it. Uh, and they're the best thing ever made in the history of the world. And they make me happy. So I totally understand. Um, well, yes. Representative, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your Friday evening chatting with me. Thank you for watching out there. And I want you to have a wonderful Friday evening and uh, come back next week. Totally. You. I'll be more than happy. I enjoyed, I definitely enjoyed this talk. Sweet. That's what I shoot for. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs>